Welcome to the Downtown Church for Online Worship. I can remember when we dreamed of the day we would grow our own youth group at the Downtown Church and our dream is now reality. Next Sunday at 5.30, August 22nd, our Downtown Youth will be meeting to kick this group off with our Downtown Youth Coordinator, Cody Williams. There will be all the ingredients for a great evening. Food, fun, and virtual reality? Parents, please plan on coming too, so you can hear about the plans for the coming year. We will be resuming in-person downtown kids right after Labor Day. To do so, we need your help and invite you to consider serving with Carla Pate to teach our youngest church family members the love of Jesus and the wonderful stories of Scripture. Please let Carla hear from you for more information and to volunteer. Today, during in-person worship, we're celebrating the Holy Sacrament of Baptism for Finian Lancaster. I thought you might want to see this precious fellow. His mom and dad are bringing their child before God and our church family to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're entrusting our congregation with the honor of joining them in surrounding Finn with love that he might grow and learn for himself what it means to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Now let's sing and worship together. Your voice it thunders, the oaks start twisting, the forest sounds with cedars breaking The waters see you And start their writhing From the depths a song is rising Now it's rising from the ground Holy, holy Let me hear from you with any updates or prayer requests. In the next few weeks, classes are starting once again throughout our country. Students will be at home and in buildings. They will learn in person and virtually. Some will be vaccinated, some will not. Some will wear masks, some will not. All of our students of all ages are depending on the adult teachers, administrators, and support staff to offer safety, leadership and learning so that school this year might grow in knowledge and how to navigate 
this complicated world. Our prayer today is especially for the start of this school year. Let's sing and prepare to pray. Lord, I've seen your goodness and I know the way you are. Give me eyes to see you in the dark. And your face shines a glory that I Almighty and everlasting God, we bow before your majesty and righteousness. You have caused the sun to rise on this day. Stars will be in the sky tonight because you form the heavens. And yet you hear the beating of our hearts, the cries of our souls, the needs of our lives. We remember both the magnitude of your being and the intimacy of your love for all of creation. We come to you today to pray for those who are homeschooled teach, administrate, and support our students. They are all beginning another year of education in the midst of a global pandemic. With determination and resolve, they will care for the students, find new ways of teaching them, seek to equip them with the knowledge they need for their future. They do so with amazing skill and strength, putting aside their own weariness and disappointment for the sake of these students. Holy Spirit, pour your blessings over them. Give them the energy they need when they feel exhausted, the hope they need in the midst of the challenges, the assurance of your good pleasure and favor throughout their day. We pray for the parents and caregivers who once again are struggling to do the right thing for their children. This year is too familiar to last year, where the way forward seemed foggy and the next step confusing. Holy Spirit, bring to them the wisdom to make wise decisions. Lord, we live and work in community. Give to them the peace to work through conflict, the humility to respect others, and the grace to seek to understand. May they teach by example what it means to be compassionate in a troubled world. We pray for the students whose lives are forever different because of COVID-19. 
We pray for their willingness to bend and adapt to the changes that seem to come so quickly. We pray for their health and safety. We pray for the forming of relationships that will build them up and strengthen their resilience so that they are able to learn and love and live abundantly. Holy Spirit, let them know of their value to you, to each other, to this world. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. in the downtown nursery and I'm excited that on Sunday, September 12th, we're going to be able to start opening this room once again to receive kids. This place has been empty for far too long and we can't wait to have children back here at the downtown kid nursery. I want to show you all some people who are new to our church, brand new as a matter of fact. I'd like you to meet Dorothy. She's the oldest of the newest at a whopping seven month old. Then there is Amelia, Eleanor, and finally Emma, who is just passing her two week birthday. They are pretty adorable and pretty precious. They're new to this world and there is a bunch they don't know yet. How to talk, how to walk, how to sing, how to read, and eat with a fork. Their moms and dads will teach them all these things, but the most important thing they will need to know now and forever is that they are loved by God. The creator of the universe loves each of them. Their moms and dads will teach them this, but this is where you guys all come in. We need you to help them learn it too. How? In the way you're kind to them how you talk to them and welcome them into your life, how you make room for them and sometimes give up your place, how you sing to them and clap for them as they learn new things. All of these are ways that will help these tiny humans grow and learn what I hope and pray you are growing and learning. All children are important. All children of, are of value. Jesus loves us all. 
Please pray with me. Holy God, thank you for Dorothy, Amelia, Eleanor, and Emma. Thank you for bringing them into the world and giving us the opportunity to show them love. May we learn as they do how wide and deep is your never-ending love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the year 2000, I started attending St. Paul School of Theology in Kansas City. I've told the story of how I wound up there before. Although I find it fascinating, I won't go there again today. Instead, I want to share how it felt to start in a seminary at the turn of the millennium, knowing little to nothing about two necessary subjects, theology and computers. On the three-hour trip from Springfield to my dorm room on Truman Road, I brought two essential items, a rocking chair to study in and a laptop. I had lots of practice with a rocking chair, three kids, but the laptop, computers in general, not so much. Remember the dial-up sound as the computer connected to the internet at what we thought was miraculous speed? I was very pleased that I could do that much, and I had a vague idea of how to use Microsoft Word to write papers. I mean, my kids all told me it was easy and self-explanatory, and okay, I'm easy and self-explanatory too. The first week during orientation, we were told to get familiar with the use of the school's library. Apparently, seminary would require a lot of research and the staff at the library was willing and able to help us. So, wanting to continue being the overachiever I had always tried to be, I went immediately to the library and asked for help. Basically, I just wanted Library 101. The librarian nicely sat me down at one of their computers, stood beside me and said, now, just key in a famous theologian you would like to know more about. And I thought, stop right there. That's why I was in seminary. I was someone with an undergraduate degree in nursing, some graduate work in group dynamics, two years of training as a chaplain, but I could not, for the life of me, pull up the name of a theologian. I must have had my deer in the headlights look because he kindly suggested, how about Karl Barth? As if that was someone I should recognize, so I keyed in C-A-R-L-B-A-R-T. And with a chuckle, he corrected me. You know, the very famous Swiss Reformed theologian, K-A-R-L-B-A-R-T-H. Delete, delete, delete. Try again. Spell it correctly. And wow, a huge list of books and articles and papers and journals and chapters and books appeared. I quickly realized this Bart guy was a person I should have known about before I even applied to seminary. I immediately said, uh, thank you, that's enough for now, you are so kind, and headed back to my dorm room and my rocking chair. Something I understood. As I rocked, I thought over and over again, what on earth am I doing here? Who do I think I am? Who am I trying to fool? I definitely didn't pull one over on that young whippersnapper librarian, did I? Ever been there? In over your head? Wondering how on earth you're going to do the next thing, take the next step. Wanting to learn, but feeling inadequate. Finding the way forward is much too complicated. Being a disciple of Jesus means we will press on. Because I believe in the core of my soul to pursue after Christ and do as he did, live as he lived, love as he loved, is the way our messed up, climate-warming, pandemic-ravaged, anger-filled world will be restored. When we say yes to becoming disciples of Jesus Christ, we're often going to find ourselves in over our heads. That's what's happening to each new group of Christians spreading throughout the world thousands of years ago, from Jerusalem to Rome, throughout the regions of Macedonia and Galatia, People were learning of the new life found in Jesus Christ. 
They have learned of the one true God who loves them and is for them. They have learned that the way forward will mean that all people have value and they are called to care for the widow and the orphans. Their experience of freedom that comes from knowing their identity is in Christ, who gave himself up for their sake. They belong to him now and forever. And they are in, way over their heads, to live this life where love is the rule, forgiveness is vital, compassion is a way of life, require new learning, intentionality, sacrifice. It may require giving up relationships because they are dangerous, harmful, oppressive. It may mean letting people into their life they would have chosen to exclude, rethinking societal rules of patriarchy, slavery, oppression. The writer of Ephesians understands how difficult it is to press on. He knows it feels as if you're swimming upstream and being pushed and pulled backwards. He knows how much easier it would be to go back, but there can be no going back. He's writing with urgency, with a sense that those hearing these words are being given the privilege and the responsibility to change the world. Their world then, our world now, desperately needs what they have to offer. They have Christ, the hope of the world, the Savior of the world. Here are these words from Ephesians 5. I'm reading from the message version. So watch your step, use your head, make the most of every chance you get. These are desperate times. Don't live carelessly, unthinkingly. Make sure you understand what the master wants. Don't drink too much wine, that cheapens your life. Drink the Spirit of God, huge drafts of Him. Sing hymns instead of drinking songs. Sing songs from your heart to Christ. Sing praises over everything, any excuse for a song to God the Father in the name of our Master Jesus Christ. So watch your step, use your head, make the most of every chance you get. These are desperate times. I hear the Apostle Paul speaking through the ages in these words. When he writes, watch your step, he's telling us we're going to need to move forward. You don't have to tell someone who's standing still to watch their step. You say that to someone who is going to walk in unfamiliar terrain, for whom the way may be treacherous, who may be older and need to be cautious, but is still walking through a new doorway, down a new path. You tell people to watch their step when you've stumbled first and you don't want them to make the same mistakes. Sometimes, if you're leading, you turn and reach behind you to show them the danger, to alert them to a bump in the road. But always forward, upstream, maybe at times, but we can't stay where we are and change the world. Use your head. Remember what you've learned in the past and get ready to learn more in the future. You and I have the capacity to learn. It's an incredible gift. We can expand our understanding of everything from viruses to the universe. We learn differently, we learn uniquely, but we all learn. Paul is asking us to use our head, our common sense, as well as our education asking, does this fit what you have learned about a God of love? Would Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for the salvation of the world, do this, do that? Use your head. Think. One of my favorite passages of scripture is found in Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, where he writes, Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Use your head. 
Make the most of every chance you've got. These are desperate times. Let's think about that for a moment. Thousands of years ago, Paul wrote, they were living in desperate times. And they were, of course they were. Death from war and illness, children died often in infancy, and mothers in childbirth. No one understood what a germ was or the importance of washing their hands. Diseases ran rampant, and entire populations were decimated. To this desperate world, Christ followers were bringing a new way of light and life and salvation to a dark, dying, corrupt world. They were risking their very lives by standing up for Jesus and the people he loved, the marginalized, the outcast, the forgotten. The world was spinning out of control, so much so that God came to redeem it. And if you squint and look or lean in and listen, you can recognize that we too are living in desperate times. The news this week about the pandemic continues to be appalling and deadly. We're on a red alert to correct climate change before it is too late. The Taliban is taking over cities one by one. So we too are instructed to do as Paul told the Ephesians, make the most of every chance you've got. This world belongs to God. It was created by God and redeemed by the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We have every chance to participate in its restoration. Make the most of it. Pray for the healing of the nations. Share your truth about why you chose to be vaccinated. Offer to help others at clinics. Support the caregivers. Encourage the exhausted. Use your head and think of ways you can alleviate the suffering Mitigate the spread, strengthen the weary. Watch your step when you purchase something. Is this contributing to climate change? Could I do this another way? Encourage recycling, diminish your carbon footprint. Write, read, learn about how your family might make a difference in the world now, not later. Not leave it for the next generation. It's too late for that. What could you do today Teach your children today. Watch your step as you move forward, but also watch those coming behind you. Could you make their way smoother? Teach them by your mistakes. Give them the hope in Jesus Christ. We need you to consider working with our own children here at the downtown church. One of my concerns is that in the past 18 months, we've missed the opportunity as a church to do what we promised to do teach them the stories of Jesus, the songs of childhood, the way they are of value to us all. And if not here, where could you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, lead another person up the stream where they could find what they need in these desperate times? Make the most of every chance you've got. And those chances are all around you. Chances to learn, to grow, to use your head, to watch your step, to engage with Jesus in redeeming this world. The chances aren't lost. They're all still there. While I was at St. Paul, my daughter, Emily, was at the University of Tulsa. When I would be working on my laptop and becoming stuck about how to fix something, put in a footnote, a line right or left or whatever, I would call her and she would walk me through it or I would send it to her and she would fix it. I don't know that I have ever really thanked her enough for those times. She pulled me out of the rocking chair and back to the desk in my dorm. But once, somewhere along my second year, I was saying, I'm just so tired of retyping something I've deleted again and again. And Emily said, just use the undo key. What? Are you kidding me? Undo? What? Nothing was lost? The little gremlins that lived in my laptop didn't eat everything? Undo? It was life-changing. Go back. Try again. The work's still there. It just needed to be found and redone. So watch your step. Use your head. Make the most of every chance you get. 
These are desperate times. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we will sing your praises. We'll walk forward with you. Lord, we cry out because we are living in desperate times. Help us to cry out in hope, in love, with courage, for you have shown us the way. We'll watch our step, use our heads, make the most of every chance, and press on to change the world. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
my soul.